Good day everyone. So this is going to be your didactics on intro to forensic psychiatry. It's going to be a two-part um, video lecture, but it's going to also have some interactive portions wherein you will be asked to elaborate on some um, topics. So when we talk about forensic psychiatry, you have to remember first and foremost that forensic means belonging to the courts of the law. So, forensic psychiatry covers the psychiatrist's professional, ethical, and legal duties to provide competent care to our patients. And it is also the patient's rights of self-determination to receive or refuse treatment. It also includes um, court decisions, legislative directives, governmental regulatory agencies, and licensure boards. It includes the evaluations of um, criminal charges, and it also covers ethical codes and practice guidelines of professional organizations and how we adhere to those guidelines. So when we talk about medical malpractice, it is a tort or a civil wrong. So it is a wrong resulting from the negligence of a physician. So we also, of course, have to define first what negligence means. Negligence means either doing something that a physician with a duty to care should not have done or not doing something that should have been done as defined by standards of medical practice. So, of course, we have to define what is standard of care. So, when we talk about standard of care in malpractice cases, this is established by asking the expert witnesses. And the standard of care is actually determined by referencing to the journal articles that are available, the textbooks, the practice guidelines, and the ethical practices promulgated by professional organizations. So that is why it's very important for us to know about the latest um, practice guidelines, what the latest textbooks uh, say or recommend, and what are the articles relating to uh, a particular um, care practice. So when we talk about malpractice, there are four Ds that you have to remember. And you have to remember that if one of those four Ds are not present, then malpractice cannot be established. So those four Ds are a duty, deviation, damage, and direct causation. So first, there should be a doctor-patient relationship that exists to create a duty of care. So, of course, if um, there is someone who is not your patient claiming malpractice, um, that cannot be since you do not have a doctor-patient relationship. Next is there should be a deviation from the standard of care. So, that means um, what is defined as the standard of care was not met. Next, there was a damage that happened to the patient. And lastly, that damage was directly caused by your deviation. So these are the four Ds in malpractice. So one example of malpractice is negligent prescription practices. This includes either exceeding what are the recommended dosages or failing to adjust the medications to therapeutic levels unreasonable mixing of medications, prescribing medications that is not indicated, prescribing too many medications at one time, failing to disclose medication effects, and there are also other areas of negligence that can still result in malpractice and it, that is not necessarily related to prescription practices, such as not treating adverse effects that were recognized or should have been recognized, um, failing to monitor the compliance of the patient with the prescription limits, 
failing to prescribe medications or appropriate levels of medications according to the needs of your patient. Prescribing addictive medications to vulnerable patients. Failing to refer a patient for consultation or treatment by a specialist. And uh, withdrawing medication in a negligent manner. So one thing that is related to that is this question. How frequently should our patients follow up? Should it be every week, every two weeks, every month, every six months? And there's actually no stock answer to that. It really depends on the situation. However, you have to keep in mind that the longer the time interval between the visits, there is a greater likelihood of adverse drug reactions and clinical developments. So, one of the recommendations is that patients who are taking medications should probably not go beyond um, a an every six months follow-up visit. So, another area of concern is speed treatment. This is a situation wherein the psychiatrists provide the medication and then a non-medical therapist does the psychotherapy, such as a psychologist. So in those situations, us as psychiatrists must still do an adequate evaluation. We have to obtain prior medical records and we have to understand that there is no such thing as a partial patient. So you cannot just say that you are just responsible for medicating this patient and you are not responsible with the psychotherapeutic outcome of this patient because we are more than just medication technicians. So that's why um, we, are, we are vulnerable to um, malpractice when there is fragment, fragmented care. So like, like I've mentioned, when, wherein you only dispense medication and you are not informed about what's happening with the patient overall. So a split treatment situations requires that the psychiatrist is still fully informed of what is the clinical status of the patient and what is the nature and quality of treatment that the patient is receiving from the non-medical therapist. So you have to um, if you do opt for a split treatment, it's very, very important that the psychiatrist and the non-medical therapist continually evaluate the patient's clinical condition and requirements to determine whether the collaboration should continue. So two terms that are frequently interchanged are privilege and confidentiality. So what is the meaning of these two and what is the difference between these two? When we talk about privilege, this is the right to maintain secrecy or confidentiality even in the face of a subpoena. This right of privilege belongs to the patient, not the physician. And the patient can waive this right. Whereas confidentiality is our professional obligation to hold secret all information given by our patients. So to be clear, a subpoena can force the psychiatrist to breach confidentiality. So clinical information may be shared with the patient's permission. Of course, it would be preferable if it is written permission rather than just verbal. But of course, there are situations wherein confidentiality will not be observed, such as in insurance claims purposes, of course, uh, the insurance carrier must have access to the information. Another is during um, quality control, so morbidity conferences, mortality conferences, and other quality checks. And then another um, situation is wherein um, patients are ordered by court to get treatment. So they need to 
know what is uh, what are the details of the treatment program. And in, of course, in your situation as therapists in training, you have to breach that confidentiality because you have to discuss the case with uh, your supervisor. So, when discussing patients um, academically, you have to remember that you still have an obligation not to disclose identifiable patient information or any descriptive patient information that would make the patient um, identifiable without appropriate informed consent. So, with regards to the internet and social media, you have to consider anything online as public. So, even if your Facebook is set on private or um, your Instagram is set on private, never ever talk about your patients even if you are just using pseudonyms of your patients or of yourselves. Because there have actually been situations wherein um, psychiatrists have blogged about their patients thinking that they were sufficiently disguised only to find that they were recognized by others, including the involved patients. And of course, in telepsychiatry, remember that um, internet communications are not confidential. So you have to inform your patient when doing telepsychiatry that there is a potential for hacking and um, of course also the electronic um, electronic records are also open to legal subpoenas. So with regards to child abuse, if you have a reason to believe that a child has been the victim of physical or sexual abuse, you should immediately report to an appropriate agency. So in our particular setting, um, we are fortunate enough that we have the WCPU who can help us to link with the appropriate agencies. And in these cases, we, all, we have to um, breach confidentiality because the potential or actual harm to the child outweighs the value of confidentiality. So next, we go to high-risk clinical situations. So tardive dyskinesia is something that is actually common in our patients. At least 10 to 20% of patients and even um, as high as 50% of our patients that are treated with neuroleptic drugs for more than a year can exhibit some tardive dyskinesia. So there have been some... Um, allegations of negligence involving tardive dyskinesia based on the following. So whether um, the, the patient was not evaluated properly or there was no consent, informed consent, so the patient was not informed or the relatives were not informed of the possible adverse effect or if there is a negligent diagnosis and if the patient was not monitored properly. So, in suicide, you have to take precautions with a suspected or confirmed suicidal patient. You have to perform a proper assessment of the patient's risk. So, if you do not do that, of course, you can be held liable. From a legal standpoint, the law tends to assume that a suicide is preventable if it is foreseeable. So that's a little bit vague because foreseeability is actually a vague legal term and it has no comparable clinical counterpart. So it's actually just a common sense rather than a scientific construct. So wala naman tayong any means of um, measuring foreseeability. So for violent patients, um, we can be potentially sued for failing to control aggressive outpatients and for discharging patients who become violent once outside the institution. 
and also if we fail to protect society from the violent acts of a patient, if it was reasonable for the psychiatrist to have known about the patient's violent tendencies. So next we go to Tarasov 1. I will not be explaining this in detail, but I will rather be giving this to the reporter in charge of explaining the history of Tatiana Tarasov. So what I want the reporter to do in this case is to tell us what was the story of Tatiana Tarasov and her stalker, Prosenjit Podar, and what with regards to um, Podar's treatment, psychiatric treatment, and uh, what happened with regards to the police, and this is related to the Tarasov rule now that therapists have the obligation to notify the intended victims or others likely to notify the victim of the danger. We also have the obligation to notify the police and we have the obligation to take whatever other steps are reasonably necessary under the circumstances. So, for example, that can be aside from notification of the police, also admitting the patient. So, the Tarasov 1 ruling does not require the therapist to report just fantasies. But if it is an intended homicide, you are required to report it appropriately. So, it is up to the therapist to exercise good judgment. So, the Tarasov 2 extends this duty to not just warn but also to protect the, vic the possible victim. So, the clinician should note whether a specific identifiable victim seems to be in imminent and probable danger from the threat of an action contemplated by a mentally ill patient. The harm, in addition to being imminent, should be potentially serious or severe. And the therapist should take clinical, re clinically reasonable action. So let's go to hospitalization. So parents patrie um, literally means father of his country. This is uh, defined as allowing the state to intervene and to act as a parent for those who are unable to care for themselves or who may harm their se themselves. So, meaning the state will decide on what is the best for the patient if that patient cannot decide for themselves. So, this is usually applicable in the mentally ill or for minors. So, two terms that we have to clarify is commitment versus hospitalization. When you are talking about commitment, it means a warrant for imprisonment. So that's why the American Bar Association and the American Psychiatric Association have recommended that commitment should be replaced by the more accurate term hospitalization when we are talking about psychiatric patients. So the emphasis on hospitalization is keeping in the psychiatrist's view of treatment rather than punishment. So the reason why the patient was brought to the institution institution was to be treated and not to be punished. So with regards to procedures of admission, um, I'm not going to go through this in detail uh, because we will still discuss this when we discuss um, the local setting, especially when we discuss the mental health but what I want you to know is that there, are, there is such a thing as informal admission wherein there is an ordinary doctor-patient relationship. So the patient is admitted in the same way that a surgical patient or a medical patient would be admitted. The patient can enter and leave at their own will even if it is against medical advice. Then there is also 
voluntary admission wherein the patient writes that he or she wants to be admitted at a hospital and the patient is still free to leave even against medical advice. Then we have temporary admission for patients who are, for example, senile or confused that they require hospitalization at that time since they cannot make their own decisions and they are still disturbed that they have to be admitted immediately on an emergency basis. So this is temporary because the patient cannot be hospitalized against their will for more than 15 days. Again, this term is um, applicable for U.S. No, So there is also what, what is known as involuntary admission. So this involves the question of whether patients can be a danger to themselves or to others. So, involuntary admission allows a patient to be hospitalized for 60 days. And persons who have been hospitalized involuntarily and who believe that they should be released can um, actually file a petition of a writ of habeas corpus. One of the fundamental rights of the patient is the right to standard quality of care. And... You have to remember that um, even if the patient is hospitalized, um, they should not be told to do hospital chores unless they volunteer for those hospital chores and they are paid for those hospital chores and it should be a therapeutic task. So not because there is just lack of manpower. Also, another right of the patient is the right to refuse treatment. So, except in emergencies, a person cannot be forced to accept treatment against their will. So, that means that we have to define what is an emergency. So, an emergency is a condition in clinical practice that requires immediate intervention to prevent death or serious harm to the patient or another person, or also to prevent deterioration of the patient's clinical state. So this is very important to remember when you have patients wherein you are unsure whether the patient is admissible or not, and the patient is refusing treatment. So you have to make sure that you are admitting the patient because it is an emergency. So just because there is a mental illness, that does not mean that the patient is uh, or should be hospitalized against his or her will. So if you are going to confine a patient involuntarily, they have to be considered dangerous to themselves or to others or they are so unable to care for themselves that they would not be able to survive outside the hospital. And that's the end of our part one. Kasi medyo mahaba na to na video. But I will also be posting the part two.